Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our fourth and final webinar with David, David Ackert, How to Motivate the Next Generation of Rainmakers. First, a couple of housekeeping tips. This webinar will be recorded, and the webinar and slides will be made available on Thursday. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat function on your screen, as everyone will remain muted throughout the session. Our speaker today is David Acker, who has over 15 years of experience as a business development consultant to lawyers. He has personally developed and implemented client development programs for hundreds of firms, from regional boutiques to some of the top AMLA 100s. Through his company, Acker Inc., he has created award-winning platforms, including Practice Boomers, an e-learning program that teaches rainmaking to lawyers, and Practice Pipeline, a platform that helps lawyers keep their most important relationships top of mind. You can learn more about his programs at AckertInc.com. David's work has garnered press from such publications as the LA Times, the National Review, the Los Angeles Business Journal, the Wall Street Journal, and the Daily Journal. He's spoken at LMA, ABA, and state bar conferences, and has been a keynote speaker at numerous conferences on the topic of client development. He is a guest lecturer at the USC Marshall School of Business and at the UCLA School of Law. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, David. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Great to be back with uh, ILN. So our agenda today uh, is pretty packed. We're going to dive right in here. The first thing we're going to do is spend some time understanding the problem, the problem with motivating the next generation of rainmakers. If it were easy, we wouldn't have to have a webinar about it. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to do is look at some of the challenges associated with motivating people in general, especially when you're motivating them to do something that they aren't already doing, or in some cases, aren't all that interested in doing. How, uh, how to address the problem of motivating Gen Xers and Millennials, because in many cases, when you're looking at this issue of how to motivate the next generation of rainmakers, it's the older generation that's trying to do the motivating. So understanding the audience that they are trying to motivate uh, will, I think, also be helpful in this endeavor. And then the problem with motivating specifically lawyers, there are certain characteristics that we tend to find most frequently in the legal profession uh, that can make motivating lawyers uh, a, a, a unique challenge. We'll look at those. And then finally, we'll move into some solutions, specifically strengths-based solutions for motivation. And I'll say more about what that is and why we're positioning it that way uh, toward the second half of this program. Let's start with our first agenda item. The problem with motivating people. So for this, I turn to Robert Keegan. He's an author who's written a book called Immunity to Change. He uh, specializes in uh, motivation topics. Uh, and in his research uh, in the health industry, he identified something very interesting here. Uh, when seriously at-risk heart patients are told by their healthcare practitioners that unless they radically change their habits around diet, exercise, smoking, et cetera, they will die. So these are at-risk heart patients who are being told by their doctors that they must radically change their eating habits, their exercise habits, their smoking habits, et cetera, or they will die. One in seven actually follow their doctor's instructions. So that's not to say the other six completely ignore their doctor. They do some version of what their doctor said. Maybe they cut down on some fried foods. Maybe they go from one pack a day to half a pack a day. Uh, maybe they, you know, do a little more exercise than they were before, but only one in seven actually follow their doctor's instructions. And in this instance, their life is on the line. So you see, we have a resistance to change just by virtue of being human when the stakes are much higher than something like, oh, you really ought to bring in a matter to the firm or you may not make equity partner someday. Um, here's another example. When life-saving preventive heart failure medication is prescribed to a patient, in other words, the doctor says, take this pill every day for the rest of your life, or you will have a stroke and die. There are three pieces of good news here. One is the insurance will cover the cost of the pill. There are no negative side effects, and it's a small pill. It's not even a big pill. Little pill, you have to take it with breakfast every morning, and it will address this heart issue that you have. But if you don't, you have a very good chance of having a stroke and dying. 57% of patients stop taking their pill within a year. Uh, when they are asked why they stop taking their pill within a year, the excuses usually sound something like this. Well, you know, I went on this one business trip, 
and I forgot to take my pills with me. And then I got back, and I, you know, by that point, I just sort of fallen out of the habit. So, you know, I don't really take them all that much anymore. But we have these kinds of these excuses, these stories that we tell ourselves that somehow justify actions that are not very good for us in the short or long term. And yet somehow we use those excuses to guide our behavior, even though we know in the back of our minds that it's not good for us and it's not going to ultimately serve the objective, which is, in this case, to live a healthy life uh, and to live a long life. And in the case of business development, is to grow a book of business and have one's own clients and have the ability to contribute to the top and bottom line of the firm through origination. So we see that we're already starting with the problem of motivating, motivating a person, let alone a lawyer, or let alone what age they might be or what generation they might be in. But getting people to do something that they aren't already doing or don't already want to do has its own set of challenges. We have to understand that first so that we can at least have some empathy for the audience that we are trying to motivate. This is not a, if I just thump my fist harder on the desk, maybe then they'll do it. Uh, because ultimately we are only um, creating a short-term solution uh, with more, more of an enthusiastic mandate. So let's look at the problem with motivating Gen Xers and Millennials, because there's a generational issue here as well that comes up often uh, on the subject of rainmaking. For this, I turn to um, some information that I gleaned from Jonathan Fitzgerald. For those of you who don't know Jonathan, he's a consultant. He has uh, a firm called Equinox Strategy Partners. And we engaged Jonathan to come in and speak to a roundtable of managing and marketing partners uh, for a program that my firm had put together. And he gave us this great presentation where he helped us understand the difference between these three generations as they relate to business development. And here's what he had to say. So baby boomers, who are generally in the role of law firm leader, value different things from the Gen Xers and millennials they are trying to motivate when it comes to really anything, but especially business development. Boomers value experience, time in the saddle. It's how they got to be where they are. They put in their time, they put in the years, and eventually it was their turn, and so they made partner, and they developed the expertise, and they, they demonstrated that they could do the job, and so now they're in that leadership position. Boomers also value rankings. They like to be first on a list or very high on a list. They want to have made this list or that list. There's very much an emphasis on uh, where you rank in the pecking order. Boomers value tradition. This is the way things have been done before. There's a precedent for this. That's comfortable, so we're going to continue doing it this way. And boomers value face-to-face -face interactions above other kinds of interactions. So if you really want to get through to a baby boomer, you're better off scheduling an appointment in advance, showing up at their office, sitting down across from them, looking them in the eye, and having a conversation with them. Gen Xers are a little bit different. They value autonomy over experience. This is the last key generation. They like doing things their own way, figuring out their own way around a problem. Uh, and they like to have the autonomy to be able to do that. They value achievement. Um, a lot of this is just by virtue of where they are in their lives. They're, uh, a lot of them, you know, in that sort of middle age bracket or maybe a little bit younger. And uh, they're at a time when they really are at that they're, uh, they're, they're ramping up to their peak earning potential and they're interested in achieving things uh, and, and gaining those accolades because that helps them to leverage that period of life that they're in currently. They're much more informal than baby boomers. They would much rather have a casual conversation than a formal one. They don't really like rules. They don't like the, you know, procedures and protocols that might be handed down to them. They'd rather, again, figure out a way to do this in such a way that's a little more relaxed. And in terms of mode of communication, they'd much prefer email or voicemail over a face-to-face -face meeting. They find it just to be more efficient, and they don't place the same value on the look me in the eye and tell me what you have to tell me. Millennials, on the other hand, have even more different value systems than Gen Xers or Boomers in that they really prefer entrepreneurship. This is a group of lawyers that tend to be more entrepreneurial than the people who are older than them. Uh, they are more open to business development than the generations that have come before, primarily because they grew up in a profession that already understood the fact that this is a competitive marketplace, 
uh, business development is not an option. It really is something that you have to take seriously. In fact, by the time they were told what the criteria for becoming an equity partner was, business development was already part of that criteria. So they get it, and they're also part of a generation where some of the richest people in the world are their age. So they grew up in a very different environment from the Gen X or the, or the boomers. They value contribution. They want to know that they're contributing to the process. They want their voice heard at the table, which is uh, somewhat uncomfortable for boomers who may feel like the millennials haven't earned the right to contribute yet. They don't have that level of experience yet, and yet the millennials feel like, no, I, my voice is, uh, is important and I want to be on this committee and I want to, uh, you know, give you my opinion of how this should go. So leaving room for their contribution is critical if you really want their buy-in. Again, like the Gen Xers, they prefer a more informal way of going about things. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, all that interested in the rules and the policies, uh, especially if it doesn't make sense to them. And in terms of communication, they value social media, texting, over email or voicemail, and certainly over a face-to-face -face meeting. So, again, it's just important to understand that not all lawyers are cut from the same cloth. Now, these are generalizations. Of course, there are ex exceptions to each of these categories. There are some Gen Xers that are more old-fashioned. There are some Gen Xers that perhaps lean a little more toward millennial in their value system. Uh, and, you know, you can say the same for any of these different uh, generations. But uh, it's good to put some thought into your audience and what it is that they value so that you don't just send the message of, do what I do or do what I think is right, do what I did so that you can have what I have. Because there will be a dissonance in the way that they hear that and it won't make as much sense as it does to you. Um, so some food for thought there. There's also a problem when it comes to motivating lawyers. Uh, and for this, I turn to the altman Weil study that was done. Over 1,000 lawyers were assessed using what they call a caliper profile personality test. Some of you may be familiar with this, but I think it's worth just going through very quickly to help illustrate this point. So what the um, caliper profile personality test identified is that there's a particular kind of personality that is drawn to the profession of law. Uh, when they uh, put these thousand or so lawyers through the profile, they compared the results of their, set of the, their uh, surveys to the results that they got from the, and the average population. They've done this caliper, pro, caliper profile personality test with a much larger subset of people who are not lawyers. And what they found was when they compared the two, that uh, the general public would, would rank as 50% on this scale by way of uh, point of comparison. Lawyers ranked much higher when it came to a quality that they called urgency. So this is a very results-oriented population, a group of people who can be perceived as impatient. They want it done now, and they want it done right. They seek efficiency and economy, and sometimes this means they can be perceived as brusque or as poor listeners. They're not interested in process. They're interested in results. They're also a much more autonomous group than the average person. This means they prefer to approach challenges on their own time and terms. Uh, they believe that only lawyers truly understand other lawyers. Uh, and they're more comfortable with knowing than learning. Again, they're more results-oriented than they are process-oriented. In terms of resilience, lawyers rank lower than the average person. This is a population that is reluctant to try new things. They are somewhat risk-averse, especially if the likelihood of failure is high. Uh, lawyers live in a world where there are winners and losers. You win this client, you win this matter, or you lose it. There is no sort of middle ground. And if an initiative doesn't pay off the first time, it won't likely be given a second chance. So uh, lawyers take a run at something that they're pretty sure is going to work. If the chances of failure are high, you won't find the lawyers to be all that interested in it. And in terms of sociability, lawyers ranked particularly low, again, compared to the average person. This is a group of people who are reluctant to show vulnerability. Uh, they rely on existing relationships rather than seeking out new ones. They'd much rather go to a bar association meeting where they are connecting with other lawyers who are like them than to go to uh, some sort of business uh, conference where they're likely to meet people who are not lawyers and try to work those rooms. And they prefer intellectual connection over an emotional one. Now, again, these are generalizations. There are certainly lawyers who fall outside of this profile. But I think if you look to your firm, to your colleagues, you're going to find that more of them fit this mold than not. And that's all well and good. These are a population that's 
ranks low on patients' compliance, resilience, and sociability. These are not necessarily skills that they have to have in order to be effective at lawyering. Um, but the problem is that when we get into the practice of business development, uh, all of these uh, weak points are going to work against them because business development requires a long lead time to results. It's not like you have lunch with one person or you have one pitch and then you get that client right away. Sometimes it takes a while to nurture that relationship and nurture that opportunity. Business development is not taught in law school and is usually not taught all that effectively if at the law firm. And so it requires uh, getting new skills in a relatively short period of time so that they can be prepared to bring in clients uh, when that expectation is communicated to them. So, of course, if their compliance is low, if this is a group that prefers to be autonomous, then learning a new skill can be challenging for them. Also, business development requires a great deal of resilience. And if, uh, if they are low on resilience, uh, in terms of their resilience, then they are not likely to go through the trial by error exploration required in order to ascertain which business development strategies and techniques are going to be most effective for them. There is no one size fits all when it comes to business development for lawyers. No two lawyers, even for the same age, the same firm, the same practice group, are going to find that the same strategy is going to uh, work well for them. One might be better off writing articles and the other might be better off sitting on panels or giving CLE presentations. They really have to work through different strategies and approaches until they find the one that's right for them. And finally, sociability. If that ranks low, then of course we have a challenge because business development, if nothing else, is all about relationship building. So when you are in a position where you're trying to motivate a group of people to do something that goes against the grain of their personality, what you're going to find is that they procrastinate in implementing it. And again, if you look to your firms, you may find that business development isn't always one of those topics that every lawyer at the firm rushes to uh, learn about and participate in. Uh, there are often excuses. It's very convenient to say, well, you know, I just, you know, got a lot of billable hours here, got a lot of client demands, and that's always going to take precedence. So I'm not sure I'm going to get around to developing business with any kind of consistency. Uh, and it's a reasonable excuse, but it's still an excuse at the end of the day if they want the kinds of books of business that they do uh, at least claim to want most of them, uh, they're going to have to put in a reasonable amount of energy into these areas that are not necessarily their strong suits. That's asking a lot of anyone, let alone someone who already has a very demanding full-time job. So rather than set ourselves up for failure and try to get to uh, get someone to do something that goes against their grain, uh, one of the ways that you can motivate the next generation of rainmakers is by playing to their strengths. Because the calipers personality profile also identified a number of characteristics that lawyers rank particularly high on. They are, this is an audience that is very practical, highly analytical, they are competitive, they're very service oriented, they, they bend over backwards for their clients, they want to make sure their clients are happy and satisfied with the work product. Uh, they're also detail-oriented, strategic, obviously highly educated. So these are, you know, this is not about uh, 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 criticizing lawyers like any group of people. They're, they have strengths and weaknesses. And the strengths that they have are, are particularly suited to lawyering. You want your lawyer to be practical, analytical. Uh, it's a good idea for them to be competitive because there's opposing counsel and you want them to beat opposing counsel. There's, uh, you want them to be service-oriented because uh, if you're engaging them, uh, then you want them to be focused on your needs. So in order to motivate a lawyer, play to their strengths. This is true of lawyers, this is true of anyone, it's especially true of them. So let's look at how to do this more specifically um, if we call out these first few strengths here based on the caliper's personality profile test. We're gonna look at strengths-based motivation solutions. Uh, a word or two about this before I dive into it. Um, I'll tell you a quick sort of personal story here that illustrates this point. So um, well, growing up, I was always somebody who was pretty athletic. I enjoyed playing sports. But the one sport that always eluded me was basketball. For whatever reason, my body just doesn't move in the way that is effective on the court. I can do football. I can do tennis. I can do a bunch of other sports. But basketball, 
was I was I was always the last one picked on the team for that. And you know, you put a basketball in my hands and I, I shoot for the hoop and I, I almost always miss. I just couldn't get my hand eye coordination to sync up for that particular sport. Um, and I tried, I really did, because growing up in, in school, especially elementary school and uh, junior high school, uh, you, you had to be pretty good on the basketball court in order to be considered okay and popular by the other boys. Um, but I could just never get myself to do it effectively. And no matter how hard I tried, I only got to be from really bad at basketball to mediocre at basketball. I never got good at it. And a lot of that is because in spite of my various efforts and in spite of my intentions and in spite of the time I put into it, I ju it just went against the grain of who I am and how I'm designed and where my strong suits are. So, again, rather than try to get someone to go from something that they're not very good at to something that at best they might become just okay at, you want to play to their strengths so they can go from good to great because ultimately there's a limited bandwidth that lawyers are dealing with here given all of the billable and administrative requirements of running a successful practice. So if we're going to wedge business development into that formula, we need to make sure that we're doing it in such a way that, again, plays to their strengths. So let's look at some of those strengths. Lawyers are practical. Uh, so let's find out what their strengths are by way of business development activities. Now, there are a number of different ways that lawyers can uh, acquire opportunities in their various communities. They can do CLE presentations, group networking, one-on-one -on -one networking. They can sign up for panels and, and participate in panels uh, in front of target-rich audiences. They can write articles and blogs, roundtable facilitation, social dinners, if they're much more of the whiner and diner type. Uh, they can interview their clients and identify opportunities there and deepen relationships there. Perhaps social media is more their thing. If they're millennials or they just happen to be more tech savvy than their peers, targeting existing clients for new business, if they're really good at that whole uh, service-oriented component in terms of the list of things that um, I showed you earlier, uh, then perhaps they should just be focused on existing clients for getting new business uh, since they're already going to be leaning in to activities that put them into communication with those clients. But the idea here is that the least resistance is going to be found inside the comfort zone. There's a lot of emphasis in business development lately on, oh, you know, business development is all about pushing lawyers outside their comfort zone. You know, that's no fun for the person doing the pushing or the lawyer being pushed. I think ultimately what you can do just as effectively, if not more so, is find the, the area of least resistance that is within the realm of activities that will generate business. So one of the ways to take a list like this and make it actionable with a lawyer is through uh, a process that we call the leverage point finder. Uh, what you're trying to do here is literally find the leverage point for the lawyer. This is part of our Practice Boomers Business Development Training Program, and we always take the lawyers through this exercise before we begin any kind of training or coaching because we want the lawyers to be able to assess where they are most likely to be successful before they put any energy into anything. The way to do this, and I, you know, I'm putting this here obviously because I'm inviting you to borrow this same concept and apply it to your internal initiatives, but the first thing that you do is you establish the venues of the forums on the far left here where you have found uh, when lawyers apply themselves lead to business opportunities. And then you ask the lawyer in this next column to rate themselves on a scale of one to five. One being poor, five being good, like very strong. And uh, where are they in terms of how much leverage they get from these various activities? So for instance, for group setting, the lawyer might say, well, you know, I'm a two on that. I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable in large groups, parties, mixers, that sort of thing. I mean, I'm not awful, but I'm, I'm certainly not average. I'm a little below average on that. Um, I'm just not that comfortable in that setting. However, one-on-one, -on -one, put me in front of a person one-on-one, -on -one, I'll do really well with them. I'm much more comfortable in that setting. I would give myself on a scale of one to five a four. And so they go down this list, as I've demonstrated here, and they rate themselves. So that's how they assess their current uh, abilities in terms of their leverage with these various venues. Then what you do is you ask them, okay, great. Now, tell us what you think your potential leverage rating would be. In other words, if you had the right amount of experience and a little bit more time with this and maybe some mentorship or some training or coaching or whatever we could provide, um, where do you think your rating would be? And then a lawyer will give themselves uh, a rating there. Now, for instance, for group setting, the lawyer might say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm really not comfortable in groups now, but 
under the right circumstances, if I had a wingman perhaps who went with me and if I had, you know, somebody just to help me come up with some icebreakers, I could probably be as good as a four on that. Um, whereas for the second line item here, one-on-one -on -one meetings, I'm a four now, I'm always going to be a four. I, I'm never going to get any higher than that. But um, for, for group settings, I could see some, some improvement potentially. So they go down the column uh, with that kind of assessment. What you're doing here is you're just asking the lawyer to comment on their own potential. Uh, so any potential leverage rating that rates a four or higher, you would circle and you would encourage the lawyer to focus in those arenas because that's where you have the lawyer's buy-in. That's where they have already said to you, you know, yes, I think that I could do well here. This is me playing to a strength. This makes sense practically much more so than my putting an ounce of energy into social media, which I rank myself as a two and would always consider myself a two. I just don't have much interest in it. Um, but, you know, if we're going to talk about group settings and one-on-one -on -one meetings, maybe some public speaking, uh, now we're talking about things that I'm interested in and willing to put some energy into. And so once you've identified where they have real potential and where their strengths are, then you can identify a next step. Great, how are we going to move the needle on this? If group settings is a potentially a four, maybe the next step is to call Jan and ask her to join you for the next time you go to a client event or a mixer or a conference or a party or whatever it might be because you just said if you had a wingman, this would be easier. So again, the, you can go down the list here and identify uh, a next step or a strategy for any of these uh, potential leverage uh, potential leverage venues that rank to four or higher. But now you have the lawyer's buy-in and now you're really hearing the lawyer when they're expressing their resistance in one arena to, uh, or another. They're not trying to be difficult. They're just telling you, look, it just doesn't make a lot of sense, practically speaking, for me to put energy into something that I'm not going to win at. Let's uh, move over to the next characteristic. Lawyers are analytical. So it's a good idea to use data to prove outcomes. We do this a lot in our work with lawyers because we find that to just tell them, look, it makes common sense, right? If you go out there and you uh, work with uh, people and develop relationships and nurture those relationships that eventually will lead to business. But that doesn't really translate it in a way that's very analytical. That's just more sort of a general practice. It's general advice. Um, so in order to appeal to their sense of uh, analysis, uh, I think it's important to look at how you can break this conversation down into metrics as much as possible. One of the ways to do this is through a referral to revenue ratio. Because lawyers understand referrals, they get referrals. Most lawyers, no matter where they are in their careers, have had at least one referral from someone, may not have uh, converted into a matter, but at least someone was thinking of them for something and reached out to them and, and had a conversation with them about their legal services. So there is a relationship between the referrals that they receive and the revenue that they generate. And one way to illustrate this would be through a formula that looks something like this. So you might say, all right, well, let's assume that the average matter that you bring in is worth about $50,000 of revenue. Now, if you're you know, a lawyer who does, for instance, estate planning or something, that number might be low, lower. If you're a litigator, or you do civil lawsuits, then of course the number's much higher. But let's just for the sake of easy math say, here we are at a $50,000 baseline for the average matter in terms of the revenue that it's going to generate to the firm. And we know that for every three meetings with a prospective client, you're going to get about one matter. Now again, that ratio may be different for some lawyers. It could be for every 10 meetings. For some lawyers, it could be for every two meetings or one meeting. But there's a relationship between the number of meetings that you have with a prospective client and the number of matters that you secure. And there's also a relationship between the number of referrals that come into your practice and the number of meetings that you have with prospective clients, because not all referrals convert into meetings. In some cases, you sit down with a referral source and they say, oh, you know, it looks like uh, I need a different kind of lawyer, or I'm afraid your fees are a little too high, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to send this person your way after all. And we know that the same is true between meetings and matters. Not all clients are going to engage you just because they spoke with you. So there is a little bit of a funnel, if you will, um, that's occurring here between the number of opportunities that are coming in at the top of the funnel and the number of matters that are coming through the bottom of the funnel. But if we look at what this translates to in terms of referral to revenue, $50,000 of revenue will require at least five referrals if this is your formula, if this is your ratio. And if you want $200,000 of revenue, well, that's going to require at least 20 referrals. 
uh, and most of the lawyers at your firm have aspirations that are far greater than that. So let's just say $1 million of revenue. Well, if this is your formula, that's going to require at least 100 referrals. That's eight to nine referrals per month. Now, most lawyers, when they start to look at it like this, will realize I'm not getting eight to nine referrals a month. I'm getting more like four to five or two to three or whatever the number is. I need to start uh, putting energy into some of those activities that we just looked at on the leverage point finder so that I get more referrals coming into my practice, which will ultimately translate into more revenue. That's a much more analytical way of looking at business development activity than just the, you ought to do this, you should write more articles, you should give more presentations, you should sit down with more referral sources. Again, it's, it's generally good advice, but it doesn't translate as effectively as putting some real facts on the table here based on precedent, based on what we've seen works, and based on what we know the average matter brings into our firm by way of revenue. So again, a more analytical approach, you may find this appeals to those lawyers who have a more analytical mind. Another thing that uh, we find to be a very effective tool for motivating lawyers when it comes to business development uh, and also to uh, help to identify some sort of uh, return on investment on the various initiatives that you may have at the law firm, uh, whether those are business development oriented or not, is to establish a baseline metric against which you will compare results. So what that means is, again, we do this for the Practice Boomers program. We have a kickoff worksheet that we give to the lawyers on the first day of their training or coaching. And, and what we ask the lawyers to do is just rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 uh, in terms of their uh, current ability to do various things that we know the program will be helping them to improve upon. So. Uh, number one, for instance, the degree to which you have clear business development goals, strategies, and a sense of direction. Most lawyers, when they enter a program like this, will uh, give themselves a fairly low rating because obviously if they had clear business development goals, strategies, and a sense of direction, they might not need to be in a program that's going to help them give that uh, to them. So they give themselves whatever reasonable uh, score or self-assessment that they deem to be appropriate. And then we collect these worksheets and we give them the same worksheet at the end of the program. And invariably we see that the lawyer gives themselves a higher score because obviously the program was effective, uh, the lawyer had an opportunity to improve over some course of time using the various techniques and strategies, not unlike some of the ones that I'm sharing with you in this webinar. Uh, and then we show them their initial scoring. That really helps the lawyers to see in very plain terms that there was an improvement made here. Uh, because sometimes memories make things kind of fuzzy. You know, I, I'm not really sure that I did all that well. Lawyers can sometimes be very self-critical. You know, I, I wanted to do much better. I wanted to bring in more business. But really when you look at even your own impression of the uh, abilities that you have in this regard, they have significantly jumped up. And uh, that helps to boost the confidence uh, that the lawyer has in themselves on these various, um, in these various abilities. The confidence is really one of the key factors in being a successful rainmaker. And so um, this is a, a process that you can take the, the lawyers through uh, that you may find to be effective for, again, the analytical mind that is looking for real evidence for improvement rather than just some sort of general feeling. Lawyers are competitive, which means that the law firm really needs to use comp to motivate change. Uh, now, this isn't to say that lawyers are solely motivated by money, but money is certainly a factor, and business development is a money-making endeavor. And so if the comp system doesn't reward lawyers for developing business, uh, that's definitely something to take a hard look at, because most lawyers aren't going to go out of their way to develop business for the firm just because it's a good idea and it's a way of showing team spirit. Um, they are going to need to have some kind of uh, personal benefit uh, on the table. And, uh, you know, comp is obviously the, the clearest way to communicate that to them. An example that I would give you here is the timely timesheet bonus, which is uh, a story that was told to me by a regional firm out of Chicago. And the firm was having a hard time getting the lawyers to turn in their timesheets at the end of the month. And so what they did was they extended a gift certificate to every lawyer who turns in their timesheet at the end of the month. And I think it was something fairly reasonable, like $100 or something like that. Uh, and what they found was uh, an issue that was uh, pretty widespread across the firm 
uh, was almost eliminated over a matter of just a month or two because everybody wanted that $100 gift certificate. Now, $100 may not be a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but uh, the lawyers liked the idea of something free, and they liked the idea of being on the list of lawyers who were now getting something free. Uh, and so they were willing to change their behavior uh, for what amounted to very little compensation as, as a bonus. So I think it's important to recognize that, you know, people, no matter who they are, lawyers, not lawyers, ultimately are uh, going to have their own self-interest, at least as part of the mix for why they do the things they do. It's a good idea to be respectful of that fact if you want them to do something that ultimately is going to profit the firm. Let's look at competition from another angle here. It's a good idea to provide peer discussion forums when you're looking to motivate lawyers, whether that's going to be um, as an add-on to some sort of seminar about business development or whether it's a group coaching kind of a forum or a roundtable forum. But what we found is that uh, lawyers like to have these kinds of discussions with other lawyers. Um, it's, uh, they are they, they like to hear from each other. They like to hear how other lawyers might approach these problems because it's good to hear a story from the trenches. They're going to hear the same advice differently from another lawyer than they are from a consultant or a trainer who comes in and speaks to them about various best practices. Uh, they're also very sensitive to status. And again, this is something that is true of most people, but certainly true within law firms. The junior partners know exactly who the senior partners are, and the fourth years know exactly who the seventh years are. And the equity partners know exactly who the non-equity partners are. There's a pecking order within a law firm, and it defines how people relate to one another and how people aspire to one another. And so if you can fill a room with lawyers who are, A, going to compete with each other just a little bit uh, to uh, advance the business development objective in the room for themselves, but also so that they can um, – uh, they can listen to other lawyers who are a little further down the road than they are and uh, formulate their own opinions and glean different uh, values from the lawyer who is in the room sharing a thought or two about how they, how they acquired their book of business. Again, the lawyer may not do exactly what it is that the more senior lawyer is recommending. They'll probably tailor it because times change and generations approach things differently. But it is useful to have uh, this sort of internal speaker component and then give the lawyers an opportunity to have group discussion based on what they've heard. Don't just do a seminar uh, with a senior partner and expect all the lawyers to just go, okay, I guess I'll do that now. They need to beat it up a little bit. They need to debate it. They need to customize it so that they can find their own way based on the information that they're getting from the senior lawyer. Also, given the fact that lawyers can be competitive, it's a good idea to um, leverage that status-oriented component that I just mentioned and have some sort of formal acknowledgement of those who excel in any new initiative. Again, lawyers are sensitive to the pecking order, and they uh, want to be winners. And so there's nothing wrong with having uh, some sort of acknowledgement, a public acknowledgement uh, that uh, allows those lawyers who have won in some regard to receive, uh, you know, a Rainmaker of the Year award or uh, the, you know, um, uh, Rainmaker in a particular practice group. Uh, lawyers do care about how they're perceived by their peers, just like everybody else, and they care about rankings. Uh, so, you know, you can set up an internal ranking system that encourages the lawyers to uh, shoot for a, a particular result. This is especially relevant in a business development context because, remember, business development takes a long time to pay off. Um, and, uh, again, this is a results-oriented population. They want something in the short term rather than having to wait three, four, five years for the payoff for something that they're doing today. So even if the payoff is uh, a formal acknowledgement from the managing partner who says, hey, good job, Mary. Uh, you know, you're Rainmaker of the Year, or you're the, you, you have accomplished the most business development activity uh, this quarter out of anyone in your practice group. Yeah, that's something that, you know, Mary can feel proud of, and the other lawyers can aspire to, um, to win in future quarters. Also, uh, leveraging this competitive streak uh, within the lawyer population. It's a good idea to use scoring systems. We found this to be true um, when we rolled out a product that was intended to help lawyers keep their key referral sources, potential laterals, prospects, et cetera, um, top of mind. 
uh, and uh, the clients, et cetera. You know, this was basically a CRM uh, for lawyers, so very, very simple interface. Uh, and we thought that because it was so simple that the lawyers would uh, be much more likely to use it. And what we found was that you know, the average uh, utilization rate for CRM at law firms is about 5%. It's very low. Uh, and our product was only a little bit higher than that in its first iteration. It was um, around 15%. So we were very disappointed uh, in our initial version of this product. So we went back to the drawing board. We said, all right, let's, let's follow some of our own advice. What are we missing here that would empower the lawyers and encourage the lawyers to use this product and be able to keep track of their key relationships uh, so that those relationships are top of mind and so that they are uh, approaching business development and those key relationships in a more organized fashion? So what we did was, we uh, rolled out a new version that had two components. One was group coaching, so the lawyers were going to meet as a group from the firm uh, once a month to discuss some of their difficult opportunities, some of those uh, tiles, as you can see here, that have gone red because they've, gone over, they've become overdue and the lawyer just isn't able to advance the needle. And then we also uh, added a scoring system that not only gave them a score based on their activity, but it also compared that score against the firm-wide average. So you can see the example there. The, the individual lawyers are 45, the firm-wide average is a 38. So this lawyer is actually trending higher than the uh, firm is as a whole. And what we found is that the utilization went up to 75%. It jumped up significantly. I think a lot of that is because of the scoring and that competitive uh, advantage, but even more so it's because of the coaching. When the lawyers knew that they were going to have an opportunity to discuss some of these challenge relationships with their peers in a forum where they could get some suggestions from each other, they could hold each other accountable, suddenly the utilization rate went way up. Now, we know this to be a fact for a couple of reasons. One, there, there was, um, uh, there was a, a, a jump in activity right before the coaching session. So we saw that lawyers would look in their calendar and say, oh, I'm supposed to meet with my peers and we're going to talk about our pipeline uh, and my score is a 22. I'm not going to show up to that meeting un unprepared. So I'm going to make sure that I've reached out to these people and updated my tiles just before the meeting. So yes, there was some procrastination there, but at least there was a, re a renewed focus and some utilization uh, on the tool because of that coaching meeting. But interestingly enough, the other uh, time that we saw lawyers um, updating their, uh, their score, and in fact, this was the most dramatic uptick, was during the meeting itself. So the lawyers would be in the meeting with the other lawyers. They're having a conversation about business development targets and the challenges that they're having. And then they would, um, at the meeting, take out their phones, open the app, and just start updating things based on the suggestions that they were getting from their peers. So, uh, you know, it became kind of a hybrid of a coaching session, a discussion session, but also an opportunity to update your tile because you're not billing hours at this point anyway. You might as well make the best use of the time. Again, lawyers are practical. So uh, that, that combination of uh, technology and the approach to the problem uh, made a big difference in terms of helping to meet lawyers where they wanted to be met. So I realize that some of the people on the call today are not only the people who are trying to motivate the lawyers uh, to uh, develop more business, but also the lawyers themselves who are looking for some tips on how to uh, become the next generation of rainmakers. So I thought I'd uh, uh, include a slide here that has a few networking tips for the next generation. This is particularly relevant to lawyers who are earlier in their careers. They may not have a whole list of referral sources and prospects and maybe their own clients that they can start to leverage for new opportunities. So the first thing that you want to make sure that you do is maintain contact with your existing network, especially within your own demographic. So th these are obviously people that you went to law school with and people that you know from uh, your various social communities. Um, but focus on the people who are your age because you're going to find that you have more in common with them. You're going to find that those are the people who will advance with you in the years to come. And while it may be tempting to try to find your way to a decision maker now, most decision makers aren't going to take a more junior lawyer seriously for a few years yet. So uh, there's nothing wrong with planting seeds 
in your network and trying to meet as many people as you can who are uh, ultimately in that demographic that you share. And again, as you meet them, uh, use some sort of system. It can be the thing that I just showed you. It could be a spreadsheet. It could be anything you like, but have some sort of system that tracks those relationships so that they don't fall through the cracks. You want to make sure that you're maintaining consistent contact with these people so that you can capture the opportunities that come across their desk and that they think of you when that opportunity comes along. Leverage your social interests for business networking. You know, um, business networking can be a pretty boring affair, having another power lunch with another person and talking about, you know, what are you, so what's going on in your firm and here's what I'm working on, um, especially in advance of any real business to be exchanged. You know, that really can be a tedious process. So I would encourage that you leverage social interests. So, you know, if you really enjoy uh, bicycling, then, Find a group of people who are strategic, certainly. Some of them may be in an inside council. Some of them may be potential referral sources, but that you all share bicycling in, as a passion. And then on the weekends, you can go bicycling together. And uh, now you have something that you enjoy doing in advance of any business exchanging hands. The business will come, obviously, as you are earning uh, that, that relationship over time, but it's a lot easier to maintain your bicycling group than it is to maintain a referral source uh, that isn't referring anything yet just because they don't have anything to give you. Um, so uh, consider that. You know, I, I have a, a group of people we meet for various activities. I, I know a group of people that uh, enjoy getting together for wine tastings, a group of people who get together for poker, a group of pe people who uh, get together based around various exercise. There's a book club that gets together of mostly lawyers who refer business back and forth, but their primary passion when they get together is reading a novel that they've all been interested in and, and exchanging ideas around that. So again, it doesn't really matter what it is. It only matters that you care about it and that you found other people that you can invite to the group who also care about it so that it is sustained over time. Um, this also ties into this notion of establishing routine events. So if you're going to put together a wine tasting, Make it a monthly wine tasting or a quarterly wine tasting. In fact, set it up at the outset to be something that is going to be recurring on a regular basis. Otherwise, you're reinventing the wheel every single time, and it's a lot of work. So it's a lot easier to invite someone to something, and if they say, oh, I can't make it, uh, you can say, no problem, come to the next one. We do this on a regular basis, uh, and it's a great way to stay in touch with existing contacts and also uh, invite other people into uh, our circle. Seek out business, business mentors within and outside the firm. Now, a lot of firms will establish mentorship relationships within the firm. They'll take a senior partner and maybe, you know, a junior associate and put them together, or perhaps uh, it just happens organically by virtue of the kind of work that they're doing with you. But I think it's really important for firms to establish business mentors as well. And if your firm hasn't done this for you, I would encourage you as a lawyer to just reach out to someone who you respect at the firm and ask them to mentor you informally uh, as your business or business development mentor. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the burden of the relationship will be on the mentee's shoulders because the mentor doesn't need the mentee, right? So it's really a matter of reaching out to the mentor on a regular basis, establishing um, the expectations, we're going to meet once a quarter, once a month, whatever it is, we're going to have lunch, and I'm going to ask you some questions on how I can improve by way of business development. And then when the mentor gives you suggestions, make sure that you come back to them soon thereafter and let them know how it went when you implemented those suggestions. The mentor needs to feel like they are making a difference and contributing to someone who is taking the mentorship seriously. So again, that's all going to be on the mentee's part to ensure that that component takes place. Now, I say within and outside the firm because I think this can also be a very effective strategy when targeting mentors who are not inside your law firm. In other words, these could be lawyers who are outside the firm. They could even be business owners outside the firm. There's nothing wrong with you going to a business owner with whom you have some sort of connection. It could be even a tenuous connection. You're a friend of a friend or whatever it might be. And saying, listen, you know, at my firm, my, uh, uh, my seniors are encouraging me to develop a book of business, and I didn't learn much about developing business in law school. Um, and here you are, a successful business person, and you have developed 
uh, substantial business. And what I'd like to do is sit down with you, maybe on a quarterly basis, I'll take you to lunch, but just hear about some of the business principles that you apply on a day-to-day -day basis that could be also applicable to me uh, as I seek to grow the business uh, at the firm. You will find that uh, you, you may be surprised that business owners uh, are flattered even by the prospect of a young, intelligent professional who has sought them out to glean uh, information from them. You know, some lawyers have an objection to this. They say, well, you know, I don't want to position myself as someone who doesn't know what they're doing to a prospective client. Uh, and, uh, what, you know, what I would say to that is that you want to make sure you are very clear in what you're asking for here. You're not asking for legal advice. You can give legal advice all day long. You're asking for advice when it comes to business development because that is something that you don't have a lot of training on. And most clients will appreciate that you're very um, candid about what you can do effectively, but you're just as candid about the areas where you're looking to improve. This also provides a forum for developing a relationship with a prospective client that would not otherwise exist if you didn't establish this bridge via the business mentorship. So it's definitely something to, concern, uh, to consider. Firms, if you have not put initiatives in place that help your lawyers implement these strategies, I would encourage you to do so because um, one of the things that is very discouraging to the next generation of rainmakers is when they have to do all of this on their own. If the firm has um, helped them to maintain contact with their existing network through various means, uh, has uh, helped them to establish routine events, perhaps even routine events that the firm hosts, uh, and perhaps even help them identify business mentors in the community that they can reach out to and coach them through the process of making that, uh, making that request, uh, you'll find that your lawyers are much more likely to do so because they have the support of the firm. So we're uh, running out of time here. I'm going to go through some final thoughts. Um, ultimately remember that firm leadership is going to drive any kind of culture change, and if we're looking at motivating the next generation, that is a culture change. So make sure you practice what you preach, uh, but also be sensitive to the fact that the way you do things may not be the way that they do things and that they're going to have to find their way. Recognize that your firm is populated with practical, analytical, competitive service professionals, so tailor your activities to those personalities. Then use compensation, acknowledgement, peer forums, and scoring to motivate new behaviors. Uh, the examples that you've heard in this webinar are some ways to do that. Remember that this kind of change is going to require venturing beyond the comfort zone, so be patient, but to the extent possible, start within the comfort zone. No one wants to jump outside the comfort zone right away. Start by playing to their strengths, and over time, you'll find that your lawyers are doing things that they wouldn't have thought they would be doing five years ago, but they have gradually found their way to that place, and that uh, because of your effort and because of their effort, you've arrived at, a, at, a, at a, a more productive position as a result. Um, so that's our agenda in terms of understanding the problem and giving you some strength-based motivation solutions. I also want to give you some resources uh, and then pass the baton over to Lindsay because uh, ILN has a number of resources that are relevant to this conversation as well. One resource is we wrote a white paper based on a market-wide study last year called Investing in Rainmakers, where we talked to over 100 law firms uh, about how they are motivating their lawyers to become rainmakers through the various means of coaching and training and mentorship and, you know, anything else that they uh, had brought to that uh, problem. And uh, I'm happy to share that white paper with you. I think you'll find the results to be very interesting. It also has a series of best practices uh, at the end of the white paper that could be instructive for you. Uh, I also showed you a, an example of practicepipeline.com. That was the, uh, the software that has the scoring system and the red, yellow, and green tiles. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can do so at practicepipeline.com. I also mentioned our roundtables for managing partners, marketing partners, CMOs. If you're interested in any of those, um, please uh, let us know. We find that this roundtable format is very important when law firms are looking for solutions because one law firm may have figured out one component of this, another law firm may have figured out another component of this, and when we bring our minds together, we're much better able to have a substantive conversation about a solution that combines those various components. And that's one of the reasons that organizations like ILM exist, to help law firms not only 
synergize their business opportunities, but also to exchange best practices and advice. That's one of the reasons that we have these webinars. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lindsay. Tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the upcoming events and other resources that ILN uh, brings to the table uh, that address this uh, issue and some of the other issues that uh, your members have. Thanks so much, David, and uh, and I, I totally agree with you. I mean, learning from each other, as, as you've been speaking about um, pretty much all along throughout the whole session, um, is, is really key, and that's something that we focus on a lot um, through the ILN. Um, collaboration is, is huge for our group, um, and one of the places that that happens is our conferences. Um, we've got our European meeting coming up um, in September. The, uh, the 11th to the 13th um, in Glasgow, uh, which we is our European focus, but we invite all of our members to attend as always. Um, and uh, we will have our Americas meeting, which will be in Puerto Rico the 5th to the 8th of November. We're having that a little bit earlier this year, um, and that's going to be a great opportunity for firms in the Americas region to discuss some. Um, areas of interest, and I think um, because we're so far out from that meeting at this time, this may be an interesting topic to address. Um, the Americas meeting has often been a place where we talk about areas of law firm management and topics like motivating the next generation of rainmakers, so um, this would be something to, uh, to discuss um, as a possibility. So um, setting up some opportunities for um, discussion both at the conference and then in between conferences. Um, to keep the uh, the collaboration going is uh, is something we can certainly look at. Um, and uh, another place that that firms can certainly broach these discussions is in our LinkedIn group. We have a private LinkedIn group for the network, um, and that's a place where you can pose questions to each other. Um, it's got a wide range of of levels. Um, it's open to all members and marketing departments in our networks. Um, there are some clients in there as well and potential clients, in-house people, um, but it's a, it's a great spot. Um, we can even set up a subgroup if you want to, um, to make that more of a management section uh, for firms that are really interested in discussing some of these issues with, uh, with firms around the world. Um, uh, and specifically, if you want to look at it regionally, that's possible too. Um, so we, as, as I mentioned, you know, collaboration is a, is a huge thing for the ILN, and uh, the administration looks to support that however we can in whatever way works best for our members. So um, however, however our members would like to do it, we're happy to, uh, to come up with the tools to, uh, to support that. But in person is certainly certainly great, and, uh, and online is, is such a useful tool. So as you were saying, David, about the different generations, um, we're happy to meet our members wherever they are and, uh, and can do that as well. Very good. Well, um, I want to thank all of you for being uh, on the program today. And as Lindsay um, uh, mentioned, there are, are other opportunities through ILN at the conferences and, and perhaps new initiatives that will uh, allow us to continue these discussions. So I look forward to that. Uh, it's been a pleasure presenting these four webinars through ILN. ILN. Thank you, Lindsay, and to your team for uh, inviting me to do so. And we look forward to future programs with you in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, David. We really appreciated it. Um, as I mentioned, we will be making this recording as well as the slides available to everybody on Thursday. And I will, as always, also be sending out David's contact information if anybody would like to contact him directly. Um, and we look forward to working with him and answering any questions anybody has. Um, please feel free to reach out to me or David directly. Thanks, everybody.